Hello, I'm Scott DuPont with another episode of Finance Your Movie, sharing tips and strategies to help you fund your independent feature, documentary, short film, or web series. Our mission is to empower you to get your money to tell your story. Okay, I am thrilled to be here with Bobby Stokes Jr. He is the founder of I Talk to Strangers Foundation, as well as the executive producers of the documentary, I Talk to Strangers. How are you, Robbie? I'm blessed. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. And there in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, we'll we'll talk about that in a second, what you're doing there. It's pretty exciting. I want to just have a very quick disclaimer for my audience. I, I told you all this, the very first podcast from season one, if I had any kind of strings attached or any kind of um, investment, conflicts of interest, whatever. So I met Robbie years ago. I fell in love with this project. You named me a producer. Um, And I do do have a small vested interest in the success of this documentary, but really, uh, I'm really more of a consulting producer. So Robbie, is there you're in atlanta georgia now and you have your whole team so we'll, we'll get into the film in just a minute but i wanted to talk if you could uh briefly share how this whole thing started like 10 years ago on a park bench in washington dc wow as a um again um with your support and i think thank you for um your meaningful um, insights um, towards the success of this project. What really started as just an idea, um, but I think idea is more of the um, infancy stage of what I would talk about how this started. It was more of a inspiration. And creativity is what I've learned in my later years is the step above inspiration. So this movement is just a creative way to solve what I saw as a problem. We don't really talk to each other. So when I took that moment on the park bench, as you said, and you can sit back and it's like having that that introspective reflection of, well, if they talked, maybe things will get better or why aren't, or why will they not speak to each other if they really cared about the issue? And this is sitting from a Washington DC national standpoint where you see Republicans and Democrats and we're just constituents alike as citizens of the, of the nation. There's simple, there's simple resolutions that could be solved if we had that conversation on a, a macro level. And on a micro level, you have parents not talking to their, their, their kids because of something that happened 10 years ago. So, it all kind of corresponded to, well, if I could be as meaningful as I want it to be as a Martin Luther King having a dream or um, a Malcolm X by any means necessary, then I would just go talk to strangers and see if it would change my life. And once that happened, I just had a story to share that maybe it can change others. And let's see how far this can go as a movement where people just accepted the idea of if we talk, something good could happen. And I think since we've, since I became involved, I don't even know, six, seven years ago, eight years ago, time flies. Um, I think a couple of things have accelerated that. I think the massive amount of distractions and social media and stuff going on out there, the news just bombarding us, I think we're more and more plugged in to our, our small screens that are right in front of our face, whether it's a, a smartphone, an iPad, a laptop, uh, an a iWatch, mm-hmm. something stuck in our ear. And then when COVID, I think that exacerbated it even more because you have a bunch of young teenagers, young, young adults, kids that haven't really talked to anybody for about a year. That became noticeable in the maturation of the idea turned into a movement of there's something we can do. We can become creative about this. And it was the kids. 
I was born in a generation that didn't have the internet. So I understand the responsibility and the importance of a conversation or a simple dialogue. When you have a movement and you're using Facebook as your movement platform, such as what we're doing, or you're using Zoom, or you're using um, the internet as a, as a basis, then there's gonna be a different dialogue that's had online. So to have these conversations with youth in real life, it was almost like um, I was their ET, or I was their a guy from a different planet, or you know, just a little different because I actually wanted to have this dialogue with them. That's where the creativity came in, where the idea of talking to strangers was a cool idea, but now we have a creative way to teach these kids the importance of a dialogue by finding meaningful ways for them to have a positive dialogue and seeing how that actually changes their lives. And that's <clears throat> what brought us here to Atlanta as um, a current initiative, which is we're not necessarily focused as much as we're having these monumentous conversations that are groundbreaking, simple dialogue, have these kids actually learning and having something to do. And then it clicked, wow, as a movement, we could have dialogue on solving problems, going back to the original idea. What if we just had a conversation about solving simple problems? Now I see there's an actual possibility of that we needed youth programs in a city during the middle of a pandemic we put youth programs in the city during the middle of a pandemic. And now, how did you do it? We talked about it. So I'm going to, because since we've got limited time here, I'm going to suggest that every person watching or listening to this podcast, uh, check out your TED Talk. I thought it was really, really powerful. Is that still up on the, the main web page or should people yes. go to YouTube? Okay, so you can find it on your webpage. I'll, I'll ask you for that information at the end, but definitely check out the TED Talk. But just in like 15 or 30 seconds before we move on to the movie, I want you to share how many countries you've been to all around the world, just, just to give the audience, this is not just one conversation here, one conversation there. This is all over the world. This is a movement. So how many countries now? So the initial launch started in 2012, and now in 2021, we've touched over 30 countries in terms of um, a personal visit, um, of myself giving a presentation or a speech or a workshop, including other volunteers who've hosted their own events and workshops, um, which has extended our reach as a nonprofit organization and social movement across 30 countries um, in nine years. So that's been our footprint thus far of having this dialogue in multiple languages, cultural backgrounds and ethnicities across multiple nations across the world. And then when this thing got bigger and bigger and bigger, the idea of, I mean, it was the perfect backdrop. And, and a lot of those, you're, you're being pretty modest. A lot of those countries you actually lived and worked in <laughs> for like Mexico, were you there for a year? It was, um, it was a two year um, there, you know, with the, the premise of what can we find as a, <clears throat> a conversation backdrop so that we had quality footage in Mexico was a great place where you have that connectivity among people. Um, but then countries like Canada, we worked in for four years where we did have the support of um, local organizations and different partnerships at different levels that kept the conversation going to over 100 events hosted in Canada. So um, the extensive work was put in due to a great team effort from um, different, I will call humans from all walks of life who saw the project and decided to do their small part to see a success. So obviously uh, filming a movie, part of it is what you're actually doing there and you're documenting, but filming this documentary in 30 countries on four or five different continents all around the globe has to cost some money. I, I wanna kind of have you kind of break it down into two segments, maybe give a little advice how you raise this money for our audience. Um, first way is you, you, you're a 501c3, C correct? Correct. And, and a lot of this has come in by generous people who have donated. Correct. 
So how have you, you just tell people, do you email people? How, how do you get people to donate? I know it's a great cause. You're literally changing the world, but how, how are, how are you getting these donations? Honestly, it's that dialogue and the power of dialogue that I've noticed in something like this can be as powerful as, hey, you said something meaningful to me five years ago, so I'm gonna donate to your current project. And I think that's been more of the inspiration that I saw in the early um, 20,000 um, that we were able to raise just in having the audacity, in my personal opinion, to make such a claim that talking to strangers could change the world or talking to strangers could unite um, people to a common level. Yeah, you, it was the initial, hey, I heard about this and it would be my pleasure to see this success or um, I saw this on your TED talk or I heard about this on the news and uh, where could I donate because this is something that is important or something I do believe in. So that just fostered just years and years of either reoccurring or new people who've heard about this from around the world um, or just in some type of headline says, hey, where can I contribute? And then our website, and our virtual donations have just been um, amazing and how we've been able to keep production going um, with wanting to go to Ghana, for instance, Africa and film. We were able to raise the money just from the supporters of hearing about the story in the local news. Awesome, awesome. And then a second component that a lot of filmmakers, documentary especially look into, but not everyone is successful. You've actually gotten a few small grants, correct? Correct. So walk, walk so us through that process sponsored. and any tips or advice on how you did those and how you were successful. Grants and sponsorships um, actually require outlook. So I think that's more of what would be the best advice I would have for anyone setting down any type of budget. Um, it's an outlook of where and what are you trying to accomplish. So for grants here in Atlanta for us to film, the outlook was the actual project itself. So the grants came in and let's call it a, um, a set grant. The set was for us to create this project where we're gonna unite people through conversation. The grant came in just making the set happen. And then you start seeing the magic of now you have something that it's not necessarily easy just to um, find a $5,000 grant to film. But if you think about what you're really trying to do, build what you're trying to build, and then you'll start seeing the people and the resources, whether it's in donations or just young filmmakers who actually want to be a part of your project, say, what can I do to help? And then at the end, you'll start seeing how much money you were able to raise by having a forethought. And luckily in 2012, we were able to see, well, this is what we're trying to do in multiple countries. So we were able to at least come up with the donations or now even the grants and sponsorships that allow us to continue to do this work of just finding different ways of bringing people together to do a positive dialogue. Now, were, were the grants where you're actually getting uh, hard cash, which is very valuable, is that mm -hmm. kind of a different process than the, um, the sponsorships where you got a bunch of food, water and stuff delivered for all the people in your community gardens there mm -hmm. in Georgia? Yes, um, the grant itself would be for the necessary equipment. So for us to continue our work, our grant included the purchase of our production lights. Our grant included the devices, the microphones, and even now continuing, it would include just the operations for us to set up our next community garden project that's built for a production set where we can have a web series built from it. So what I'm starting to notice now is as a filmmaker, having an outlook of this is how this benefits an audience seems to be key when someone wants to fund a project that actually sees that not only are we funding a project that's creative, but we're funding a project that's actually helping others. So why not just allow these creative ideas to actually make impacts on local communities? Yeah, and what, a, uh, what an impact you have made. I really... Uh, I'm proud to call you a friend and uh, just, just seeing what you've done to people all over the world is amazing. Um, I want to talk to, uh, I want to ask you for a, a few bits of advice to 
the filmmaker audience out there that's still looking to raise their money. They're trying to finance their own movie, their own web series. And uh, I'll never forget this conversation. I had a conversation. It was a younger guy, probably 21, 22 years old. And he goes, you know, you focus all the time on talking to people. And I got my last fun, uh, movie project funded strictly by texts and emails. And I didn't have to talk to a single person. And I said, what was your project? And he, he quickly admitted that it was something on Kickstarter. And I said, okay, so what was the largest amount of money that you got through texting or emailing or DMing or IMing somebody? And he had to think for a minute. And he said, well, the most was $500. And I said, well, there's a big difference between a 10, a 50, a hundred, $500 donation and someone stroking you a $10,000, $25,000, $50,000 check. And just in my experience, true, it usually helps when you talk to somebody. <laughs> true. So you, you're like one of the, you're literally one of the world's experts about not only just talking to people in different languages and continents all over the world, but talking to strangers. So what's some advice for people that they're, they're not really comfortable with just talking to hundreds and hundreds of people, which it sometimes takes to get a film funded? You know, honestly, the more... I do uh, find myself in funding situations. And even now they're being offered more than I'm looking for them. And it's just having a plan. And I think throughout this filming process, one, you're not always, actually most of the time, you're not going to accomplish the plan as planned. But if you want people involved, if you want the volunteers, if you want the donations, the sponsorships, the grant opportunities, what's your plan? So I've at least seen having a plan is like a 50% boost of not having one at all compared to someone who's just looking for funding without a plan, which typically seems to be the people standing in line. Tell me more about your film project. Well, here's the idea. At least when we approach anyone with, this is what we would like to do, the plan shows the well thought out, this is what we would like to accomplish but then we also have a track record of these are other things that we've planned and accomplished that gives confidence for the next funder or that next larger amount to supply the, the bigger piece of that plan that's needed. For us, it was a community garden. So we were able to accomplish that and more through having a plan that we wanted to have the ending of a film be here. And this is the community garden scene. Everything else just came because we had a plan to do it. Interesting. So when, when you're reaching out and talking to people in your community, you're really not, let me, let me make sure I, I'm understanding this. You're really not so much pitching your film, but you're talking about this community garden and the impact and the overall plan. And then kind of the film is part of that. It's, the film is just the visual evidence of a community coming together. The film is just the proof. So you have to, you, there's, even when I've seen film, uh, there's been a lot of filming here in Atlanta actually that I've seen, they'll create a whole set. And there's so much that goes into the set. And then you start noticing that's what young filmmakers want. They want it to look real. So you got to pay for all these extra people and all the stunts and all the shrubberies and the craft services. That's what you want your budget for, to make it look real. So that's what I went for the money for. Let me make this real and then film it. Now you have something that has more of an investment to why people see the need that we need to film this because it not only is something that's real, it does make the community better. So it became more of a strategy that we should continue this concept of creating these sets, these gardens that make the community better and let's film it. And we have a perfect recipe for our film project. That, that's a really, uh, you summed it up quite nicely. So um, great, great words of advice, especially for people out there that, who are doing uh, documentaries and there's some kind of cause or some kind of mission, which I believe all documentaries should have some call to action. Um, speaking of call to, calls to action, but before we get there, so 
you're you're looking for the last fifty or seventy five thousand dollars right now for your post production, a little bit of marketing. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So for any of our millionaire flicks uh, audience out there, if they wanted to be part of this film uh, from an investment point of view, as well as supporting your worldwide mission, what's mm -hmm. the best way that people can reach out to you or contact that's you? Best way would be through our website um, as a first form of contact, and that's italktostrangers.org. And with our film section, it allows you to not only visit to see some of the production progress, um, you also get the bios of Scott, myself, and the rest of our film team. And from there, we can start the dialogue of if you want to become more invested into the film, as far as a tax deductible donation, um, just the perks of being a part of our film team is something we would like to offer uh, any serious investment. So the website would be a great place to start. And um, also through um, email, me personally, and that's Robbie at italktostrangers.org um, to get a conversation started for any type of film investment as well. Awesome. And if someone just wants to maybe find out about uh, starting a program or maybe uh, volunteering, they can do that through italktostrangers.org as well. Yes. So again, at the website, um, there also are volunteer opportunities for even at home projects that we would like to launch where anyone in the world could, let's say, grow your own garden with our Grow Green campaign. Well, we're just encouraging anyone just to continue to foster this rejuvenating the green earth through a patch of land that you have right in front of your house or something you put in your windowsill. So there's different volunteering opportunities, both locally and internationally, of things that anyone can do to continue a positive dialogue. Awesome. Um, any parting words of advice to young filmmakers out there who are just still a little bit overwhelmed of going up to a multi-millionaire or a billionaire? Ho hopefully they're gonna have some kind of connection to these people when they're Perfect. reaching out. But just going up to someone to talk about their project, ultimately to get funding. And you're, you're the best guy to ask for advice because you've had rifles pointed at you. You've had bullets flying over your head. You've had knives. You've had your life threatened in multiple countries. How do you get rid of that fear <laughs> and simply walk up to strangers or walk up to people? I mean, when you put it like that, it does make It's the truth, real. man. It's the Jeez. truth. <laughs> Drug cartels. You know, I never lost the interest in humans. I think it's a humanity thing. It seems weird. And I have a, a, a part of my brain that does have a, a, an interest in my safety or interest in my surroundings or interest in is this person think I'm completely crazy. So I get that. But the curiosity of just knowing humans are humans, there's just something about knowing that we all have to take a bowel movement or that we all need water in our lives or that we all have someone in our life that we care about, that we get emotional, brings a little human side that becomes more curious to connect than to fear. I've just grown not to fear social status or economic status or skin color or race or religion and just try to find that thing, whether it's family, food, or family, uh, I'm sorry, family, food, or kids that makes, or puppies, that makes people smile. And then once you break that, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking or how you're doing it. Everyone agrees that kids are cute, puppies are cute, and that family is important. And I think that's how you can start any dialogue. And then from there, that exchange of, so what are you working on? You can say anything from, I'm working on a project about the pig that flew to the moon, or I'm working on the project that's going to build wells in South Sudan. And that person now sees you as a human to hear you as a, you know what, let me help you. And that may be that conversation where they heard that human connection and they just want to lend that helping hand as most humans want to do. And I learned that as a trick of the trade that every human at least wants to do good and try to find yourself on that do good attitude. Awesome. Awesome. I especially love the thing about the puppies as well. 
<laughs> Great stuff. Um, Bobby, we went a little bit over, but uh, thank you for, um, I know you're super, super busy today with all the stuff you got going on there with your different gardens and, uh, and the filming. Um, thank you so much, brother. I love you. And uh, we'll talk soon. Tune in next week. Or for more info, visit financeyourmovie.com. Thank you for listening. And remember, if you have a story to tell the world, never give up on your dream. Copyright Nemours Marketing.